This is the wingman. Do your pre-flight checks. Get your helmet on and strap in because we're going nine Gs here. We're taking you to new heights in business. Welcome to the very first episode of Wingman. I'm Brad Barker. Uh, at Wingman, we're, what we want to do is actually bring you people who are in the industry that we consider to be industry-leading wingmen. Uh, most of you, as you may recall, as you've gone through your business career, you've had people on your wing helping you out and looking out for you. And one of those people today, the very first person I'm interviewing is uh, one of the people that I consider to be one of the best wingmen in the industry. That is uh, Graham Hawkins, the the CEO and the founder of Sales Tribe. Welcome, Graham. Thanks, Brad. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. It's a very exciting. And um, when I thought uh, who's one of the people that is uh, dynamic and is making a big change in the industry, and you're really pushing the envelope in this space, particularly in the sales area, uh, you're the very first person I thought of. So it's great to have you have you here and talking with us today. So. Well, I like to be controversial, Brad, and shake things up a little bit. Um, and I'm certainly doing that in certain sections of the uh, business world right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, Grant, you've um, been running Sales Tribe for is it about four years now? Yeah, just coming up three years. Three years, great. Yeah. Excellent. And before that? Transform Sales International, so a small consultancy business here in Australia. And uh, prior to that, it's a mixture of you know, 25, 26 years of sales and sales leadership roles, mostly in the tech space. Yeah. Mostly, Brad, working with US software companies. And um, yeah, a real mixture of roles throughout Asia Pac and also spent some time living and working in the UK. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Now, Graham, you got on my radar because um, I'm a LinkedIn user, uh, not the most prolific LinkedIn user, but uh, you seem to be coming up in my feed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I have to say that LinkedIn has not only changed my career and business world, but probably changed my life, to be honest. I know that sounds a bit melodramatic to say that, but I went back to school in 2012 to do an MBA, and I was really lucky to be surrounded by a whole bunch of millennials, yeah. <laughs> these young people. And they were, back then, they were doing some interesting stuff with Facebook ads, and you know, Twitter was obviously big at that stage. I don't think Instagram had sort of taken off yet, but... I started to see this opportunity to learn from these younger people about, you know, content marketing and pushing content on, out on social platforms. Was it a fad back then? It sort of was a little bit. And I have to admit, I felt like I'd, you know, joined the party late. I thought, oh, yeah. you know, everyone's already doing this stuff. I've missed the boat. Yeah. It turns out I hadn't missed the boat. It was, yeah. it was still early. Yeah, so You're rated one of the highest uh, LinkedIn users in Australia, aren't you? Or yeah, I was given an award by LinkedIn Australia uh, last year, um, Top Voice Award, wow. along with a number of other people. So I, I am fairly prolific on LinkedIn in terms of pushing out content. And I, uh, I learned from the MBA, mate, that um, visibility creates opportunity. Yeah. And you know that from our sales background as well. But the sort of visibility that you can get on platforms like LinkedIn, where all your buyers are now you know, going to learn about stuff is just phenomenal. I mean, it's a global, truly global market. Someone said to me once, it's better to be known than to be the best. Well, yeah. Um, my favorite thing is we don't all have to be thought leaders, but we do all have to be thought contributors. Yeah, interesting. You know, you've, got to be in, you've got to be engaged in the conversation. So how's LinkedIn, um, so you said it's changed your life. Like, um, so how, how's that evolved for you, the, the whole LinkedIn experience? So you said it started with the MBA. Yeah, it started with the MBA. Um, having done a research project and gone out and interviewed buyers, I was very interested at that stage in buyer behavior yeah. and all that change that you and I have talked about previously. Yeah. Um, did the research project, interviewed buyers, wrote a book, wrote a second book, and just got really fascinated in all the change that was happening. Yeah. Then I started to realize, well, I've got this content here in this book, chapters. Mm. Why don't I start pushing some of that on LinkedIn? out on LinkedIn and this was you know 2015 yeah so five years ago and as I started to dabble with content I started to realize that you know well early on nothing much was happening I'd push out an article or a post or something and you know I'd get three or four people like it mostly friends or whatever but then I realized if I just start to engage with everybody that engages with my content and get them into my network then they see my next post yeah so I'd, I'd push out some content I'd build my network Yep. The, more, the bigger my network gets, the more people see the content. The more content I push out, the bigger the network gets. And I chipped away and chipped away and chipped away at that, Brad, for a long time, 12 months or so, yeah. without a lot of success, I have to say. Yep. 
but then it started to grow a life of its own. So was it addicting creating the size of your network? Was that sort of what kept you going? Or? I have to, yeah. I, because I, you weren't getting much results early on, right? So. No, early on, like everybody else, I was, yeah. you know, a, another voice in amongst the, the huge herd. Yeah. And so... And, and, sorry, Grant, back then were you seen as a... Um, a an industry leader in sales and uh, that sort of thing back not, then? Not as much as I am now, of course. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate in that I'd taken the, the time and the effort to go and write a book. So I had that. Yes. So I had a book to say. Yep. Which is Sales Transformation, right? Yep. So that's your first one. That was the first yeah. one, yeah. So I had that and I thought, well, I'll start pushing some of that content, my message out to my target audience on LinkedIn. But yeah, early on, you know, nothing much was happening. Yeah. But then, as I say, it started to really grow exponentially and... The more it started to grow, the more excited I got because yeah. now I'm reaching people in all sorts of... So, case in point... Well, you've gone international, haven't you? We have. Yeah. We literally have. We've got clients now in the UK, the US. We've got clients in France, Dubai, um, obviously Southeast Asia, Australia, wow. New Zealand. Yeah. All because of LinkedIn. That's amazing. So, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant story. I, um, I love hearing it. So, your first book, how did that go? How well did that go? So um, when people ask me that question, you know, in terms of sales volumes and all that sort of stuff, not fantastic. Sure. It's a niche book. Yeah. You know, not everybody. But it was a good learning experience, right? Oh, incredible. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I absolutely maintain, and you'll, you'll um, associate with this, is that when you get to a certain age and you've had a certain amount of experience in business, yeah. there's a whole lot of stuff in the back of your head that you don't realize is sitting there. Yeah. It's not until you start writing and yeah. getting it out that you start to realize, actually, I know, a, I know a fair bit of stuff. Yeah, and you've got to put it in a structure that people can understand and that want to, yeah, yeah I, I, I understand. I've never written a book though, so not there yet. <laughs> well, you're on, you're doing posts and whatnot on LinkedIn. So getting it out of your head and onto paper or into a post or on a blog or whatever, yeah. it's a really interesting process to go through because we have all got lots of experience. And when it comes to sales, it's all about, am I helping clients solve business problems? Mm. And with 25 years of experience before I wrote the book, yep. there's a lot of history of helping clients solve problems. Yeah. So talk about it. But Graham, you must be doing something right. I mean, it's one thing to build a followers and, and a base and all that sort of thing, but it's now things are, seem to be growing exponentially for you. So what, what are you doing right? Well, the best thing um, in terms of doing things right, Brad, um, that I did, I think, was to go out and interview buyers. Yep. Um, you and I have talked about this before. I spent 25 years listening to every sales guru on the planet. Yeah. I worked for companies that would bring in the obligatory sales trainer for the two days offsite every year. Yeah. I would do, you know, every sales training program known to man. So I've done precision selling, solution selling, target account selling, challenger, spin, yep. value-based, Sandler, Millerheim, done them all. Yep. Right? I got sick of hearing all of that repetitive messaging. Mm. And instead, what I decided to do was go out and actually interview buyers and ask buyers what they thought about engaging with vendor salespeople. Well, I'd, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on what they said to you. So this was part of your MBA? It was. And um, so it was it was under the, not the guys, but it was under the um, the impression that, okay, this is research and I'm doing. Yep. So they were a lot more willing to open up and, and be honest with you as opposed to if you were a vendor saying, hey, can we get some feedback from you? I was, I was surprised at how willing, and, and let me just describe, I'm talking about uh, procurement and vendor management people in enterprise level companies. So yep. companies like Telstra, Qantas, Westpac Bank, Suncorp, some of those big end. Yep. Um, I would contact these people and some of them I knew from sales days. Yeah. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm um, doing some research for an MBA right now. I'm thinking about writing a book. Would you mind if I did a quick interview with yeah. you? Most of them were really generous with their time. And most of them were <laughs> pretty brutal and frank about yep. their experience on the other side of the table. Right. So did they, did they give you examples of what had happened to them when they yeah, talked they to you? Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. And it was, um, for an old school sales guy, it was, it was not only confronting, but it was consistent. They all said the same thing. So things like, um, I would ask the question, so tell me, you know, Brad, Mr. Buyer, um, what's it like for you to engage with vendor salespeople? Yeah. And, you know, I got, I got feedback like, Graham, um, 
salespeople are like fucking robots. Yeah. You know, they all sound the same, look the same, dress the same, um, use the same business buzzwords, same PowerPoint slides. They think we don't know what the spin model is. We do. <laughs> uh, one of them said to me, we know we only have to wait until 5 p.m. on the final day of the month and the, right. you know, the salesperson will drop their pants and give us a discount. You right. know? Wow. So I got a lot of that sort of feedback. Yeah. So what are that? I mean, you, you've been in sales for a long time, right? So, yeah. uh, and I suspect you may have used spin yourself yeah, in the past, of course. spin selling. And um, so, what was that like to hear that when they told you that? To say it was a light bulb moment would be an understatement. Yep. Because I'd I'd done I'd been guilty of doing all the things that I heard, mm. um, and you know, in fairness to everybody out there in sales, we're all doing what we're trained to do. Yeah. You know, handling objections, overcoming objections, yep. prospecting, and mm-hmm. Um, you know, closing techniques, yep. all that stuff. And when I look back now, it's kind of embarrassing. But yeah, we all did it. So I, I didn't feel bad. It was just how things were done. So this is the part that I'm dying to understand. Like, what was the light bulb moment for you? And how did it rewire your brain to approach the market differently? Well, I started as a as a result of this feedback, I started to look seriously. Once I got over the, sh- the shock of these, you yep. know, these comments... I started to look seriously at where the world was going from a from a tech enablement mm-hmm. standpoint as well. Yep. And obviously, with access to information, everything had changed, I argue, uh, you know, 180 degrees. Because when I first started selling, we had, um, uh, what do they call it? We had information asymmetry. Right. So as vendors, we had all of the information and yep. buyers had none. Right. But now we've reached this point in time where buyers have got access to the same information as the vendors. Okay. So I started to see a big change just around that. Yep. Then you overlay that with, um, you know, the internet and access to information and, um, you know, buyer intent data, sentiment data and all of the things that buyers can now do. And it just all pointed to the one thing and that is vendor push business models are dying. Mm. Mm. So uh, give me an example of the information that they've got um, that the salespeople have as well. What, what's an example of that? Well, just access to product information, you know, mm. how to solve a business problem. Type it into Google. Right. Up comes all of the, you know, up comes all of the information about how to solve your problems, your business problems. Yeah. And here are the recommendations on certain vendors. Jump on Gartner and look at the Quadrant or G2 Crowd or Trustpilot. Yeah. And you've got all of this. So, you know, so you're saying that clients devise what the solution is before they even meet with the client? Well, if you, if you listen to analysts like Sorry, CEB, before they meet with a the salesperson. Yeah, correct. Yeah. CEB and a lot of the world's big analysts say now that um, not only do buyers prefer to self-serve wherever they can in a B2B context, but they're 60 to 80% of the way through decision-making yep. before they talk to a vendor. Right. So then, then it comes down. So then they'll go meet with a, um, a vendor and then really what they're looking for is what differentiates you from this other solution that we're, well, we've already seriously looked at. Yes, but worse than that they've probably already picked their preferred vendor yeah. by the time you're talking to them. Yeah. So they've listed all their requirements. Mm. In column A, they've got preferred vendor because they've done their research and they've probably spoken to some people about, have you had this problem as well? Yeah. How did you solve it? Oh, we talked to HubSpot or we talked to yep. Salesforce or whatever. Yep. So they've got preferred vendor in column A. Yep. Then they're going out for two other quotes, column B and column C. It just to tick a box, Tick right? a box. Yeah. Correct. So if that's the environment we're working in today... What does that mean to the, for the average salesperson that's out there at the moment? Well, it means everything's different, right? Yeah. It means you have to learn as a salesperson now how to approach customer pool selling, which is the opposite of what I've done. Right. It's no longer about how many calls have you made, how many meetings have you got, how many, how big's your pipeline, have mm. you got three to five times quota in your pipeline? Yeah. All of those old-fashioned metrics, they're they're kind of dying. Yeah. Now it's all about how can I use data and analytics to get insights around buyers' tastes and preferences. Interesting. And how can I get buyer sentiment data or intent data so that I call the buyer at the right stage in the buying journey and I give that buyer the right message at the right time on the right channel on the right platform. Mm. You know, Mm. it's a lot. We just have to be more, if I can summarize it in a nutshell, salespeople now have to be a whole lot more sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, well, so tell us about how do you how do you get a salesperson who's been taking this um, antiquated or expired approach, how do you get them to go from that world to this world that we're saying that our 
clients are in. Well, that's that's a massive challenge. And Sales Tribe now, as a sales enablement company, that's my biggest challenge. In fact, let's go one step further. The way salespeople are measured, managed, and rewarded now is my biggest challenge. Yep. It's not it's not necessarily trying to convince the salesperson mm. that they need to change. They know they need yeah, to change. Yeah, because their bosses are going to keep telling them to do what they think is right. Yeah, that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. It's not the salesperson. So it's person. changing the leadership. It's the leadership. Yep. The, I argue now um, the biggest challenge to driving any sort of significant change inside a business is management's outdated assumptions about what clients want. Mm. They're mm. often too far removed from the the market. They're not out there in the field like the salesperson is every day, yeah. hearing the feedback. Yeah. They're not aware that the bar's being raised on customer experience. Yeah. And so quite often they just say, well, no, hang on. Sales has been that way. It's always been the same. Yeah. You know, just make more calls. So, Graham, what if you were to talk to um, sales leaders or business leaders out there today, what would be the big thing to say to them regarding their salespeople? Because the world's changed, right? What, what advice would you give them around that? If I'm talking to senior people, yep. decision makers inside businesses, mm. my question to them is, why are you asking your salespeople to sell the way you don't like to buy? Oh, <laughs> that's rich. That's good. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. I was with a, a sales director the other day and we were sitting having a, just a casual chat. His phone rang and he looked, picked at his phone and he went, oh, bloody recruiters cold calling me again. Yeah. I said, oh, that's interesting. Do you ask your team to cold call? Yeah. And he paused and he went, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yep. And I'm not picking on sales leaders because quite often sales leaders are told from the top down, mm -hmm. just keep making calls, keep getting meetings, keep filling the pipe as, with as much stuff as you can, hoping that something drops out the other end. Yeah. Yep. Because it's uh, it's a, like a scattergun approach, right? It's a completely it's a game of numbers. I, I've heard that a lot in the sales industry. It's just a game of numbers. That's all it was. Yeah. My very first week of sales, 1989, December 1989. Yep. I had a week of induction training, and that was the key theme of that week. Yeah. Sales is a numbers game. Graham, I was told make 100 calls, get 30 interested parties. From the 30 interested parties, you'll make 10 meetings. Your 10 meetings, you'll close three. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and the world's changed, right? It has. Yeah. It has. We have to be more sophisticated now. Yeah. And we can be. So to go back to your question, if we can get senior leaders to realize that the way we're measuring, managing, and rewarding salespeople has to change, yeah. then the salesperson can be freed up. Yeah. I use that term freed up to go and deliver a delightful experience to the buyer. And when they do that, they can sit back and go, if I keep doing this, the leap of faith here is if I keep giving the the, the delightful experience that the buyer wants, the sale will take care of itself. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now, so Graham, you you moved. Um, so you, you did your first book. That was your first uh, move into this, or well, your big move into this space, and LinkedIn. And then you went into your your MBA. Uh, and from your MBA, you wrote your second book. After your MBA, you wrote your second book. Yeah. Um, well, both came after the MBA, but the sales okay. transformation was first. I got so immersed in this change that I was kind of now uncovering. Yeah. And as I was learning about the power and scalability of social to, to get a message out there and, and to really identify a target customer and find out what's important to them, I then decided I'd write a second book, which is The Future of the Sales Profession. Brilliant. So yes, and I, I noticed you go back into the past here to write that. Yeah. So your mum was a historian, wasn't she? She was. She, she was. was. Yeah. yeah. Mum always said to me, "You can't know who you are today until you realise where you've come from, or yeah. until you understand where you come from." Yeah. So I went back over the 130 years of history. Yeah. Um, recorded history in sales. Yeah. And I've got to say, right back to 19, sorry, 1884, um, not much has changed. It's John H. Patterson. The short version of that story is that John H. Patterson, guy in, in Dayton, Ohio, bought a company called National Cash Register back then, yep. which has subsequently gone on to become NCR. John H. Patterson, as a you know an entrepreneurial guy in the late mm. 80s, mm. 1880s, um, early 1880s, I should say, realized that what he needed to help him grow his business was autonomous agents out in the field. Yep. And so he gave them a geographic territory. He trained these people up and he said, go out into the territory and that's your patch. And to reward them, he gave them a commission mm -hmm. and he measured them on a quota. Yep. And so sort of the birthplace. And 130 yeah. years later, <laughs> we've still got quotas, territories and commission. Interesting. So I argue in the book, I'm not sure how successfully, but yep. 
I argue nonetheless that um, not much has changed. We've had lots of iterations and flavors of sales, yep. as a, you know, precision, solution, challenger, spin, all of those things. But the fundamentals haven't changed much at all until now. Yep. Now it's all changed. Great. So what are the big things that you think has changed? What would you say has changed the most? Well, that shift from vendor push selling to customer pull. Yep. You know, you, you, we can no longer treat the buyer as a as a virtual adversary that needs to be conquered. Right. You know. Yeah. You and I have talked about it before the, the creating the the win loss scenario. I mean, mm. terms like if you think about it, Brad, logically, if you think about terms like buyer's remorse and post purchase dissonance, mm. those terms came about because salespeople, I was trained, mm. get the sale at any cost. Yeah. Um, and that invariably leads to over promising and under delivering. Yeah. And buyers end up feeling very wary and very distrustful of salespeople. Yeah. So that stuff can no longer go on with an educated buyer. Yep. Buyers know what they want. They can solve their own problems. They don't need you coming in and overcoming their objections and closing them. So, Graham, do you, I mean, you do a lot of training, right? So you come yep. across a, a lot of different types of salespeople. And do you, do you ever get that salesperson? It's like, I've been doing it like this for the last 30 years. It's been working. My numbers are great. Yeah. You know, what, you know the type of salesperson I'm talking about. I know right? exactly the type. And, you know, frankly, I was that type a while back. Yeah. Um, where you think you know everything and you've been successful and you've ridden the wave and all that stuff. And you don't need some person telling you that you need to change. But the truth is now everyone needs to change. Yeah. And guess what? All of those old guys, mm. they're coming to us now, a lot of them. Yeah. And they're saying, you know... Shit, the world's changed. <laughs> yes. Everything's changed. I'm yeah. finding it difficult now. Yeah. So some proof points for you. Yeah. Sales attrition is double any other department, generally speaking. Yes. Right? So there's more turnover in the sales department. 16.8 months is the average sales tenure. And so it's not appealing to be in the, that well, space. It's not at all now. And yeah. worse still, get this one. Harvard Business Review said in 2018, I think, that 63% of the world's B2B salespeople are failing to meet or exceed quota. Jeez, that's scary. Imagine <laughs> if imagine if 63% of the world's doctors were failing. Yeah. Or, yep. you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of um, turbulence and a lot of volatility going on now in the sales world because of all of this change. Yeah, that's incredible. So, sorry, Matt, back to the book. Yeah. Um, what are the big... Look, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic book and you uh, got an award for that as well. Bestseller, international bestseller. Yes. Yep. So, um, where, where did that take you? Look, the book's been amazing in terms of um, just credibility, I suppose. Um, I didn't write it for any commercial reasons. I, I wrote it because I was fascinated in the space. And as a business card, there's nothing better. You yep. know, you turn up to a meeting and you give people a copy of your book and they, they always have that kind of, oh, wow, yeah. reaction. Yeah. So it's been brilliant from that point of view. Excellent. Oh, that's good. So um, the, let me see. So, sorry, the, the big thing here is you, you're saying, so the world's shifted yep. a lot. You've got these people who've been in sales for a long time who've been turning over their jobs quite a bit. You know, one of the things that I notice with salespeople is that they, if they've been in the one job, for over 10 years, they find it very hard to go to a different job and do things differently. They, yes. they seem a bit discombobulated as 100%. well. So um, it, why do you think that is? Why do you think people find well, it difficult? everything's accelerating, right? Everything's yeah. speeding up. And there's this real law of diminishing returns now that happens when someone stays in a sales role for too long with, with the one company. Yeah. Um, like I, I'd almost say that um, it's hard to employ a person that's been in a job for that long. I agree. I agree. And we get... We get salespeople joining the tribe and we, we put them forward into, you know, exciting new companies that want to interview them in some cases and quite often they don't do well because of that. Yeah. I'm not advocating for changing your job. Well, maybe I am. <laughs> it's not like I've ever stayed in a job that long either. But it's, uh, what I did notice is that by um, going from one job to the next after, say, three years or four years, it's like I, I've brought in something fresh, something new, that something that they hadn't seen before and... They always tend to be a bit stale, but that's why they also needed me as well. Yeah. Um, so how long would you recommend a person stay in a job, particular job for these days if yeah. you're a salesperson? Because you said, you know, on average, it's only 18 months or less. Look, it's a, it's a tough question and it depends on the industry. I mm -hmm. mean, I work a lot in the tech world, so I deal with a lot of the high tech companies. And 
the rate of change, you know, the shortening of product cycles and life cycles, industry life cycles in that space is unbelievable. Yeah. And when you look at what's happening now with the future of work, so the rise of the freelance economy, the contingent workforce, the way millennials now want to work, yeah. um, staying in the same role for two, three, four, five years is, is almost unheard of now Yeah. because people are changing and business is changing so quickly. So I argue um, in the book that, it's incumbent on every salesperson now or any, any business owner that's trying to you know, sell their, their wares, their product or service, to be a deep domain expert in their field. They have to be a specialist yep. because when I interviewed buyers, Brad, um, one of the, the key feedback items I got was we expect our salesperson to be able to teach us something. Interesting. If they can't teach me something, mm. I haven't got five minutes for a coffee. Yep. Yeah. I got that kind of thing. So they want to find out something new about the industry or something new about a particular space that they're in or... Yeah. Yeah. They want to know they're dealing with a specialist yep. who can educate them. And if you can't educate them, then what role do you play in the value chain? Yeah, interesting. So is, is that one of the things that you recommend with your training is to... Got to you've got to be a specialist. Yeah. You've got to specialize. You've got to be seen on the platforms where your buyers now reside as yep. a, re a potential resource that can help them solve problems. Interesting. And what I mean by that is... Give them information that they can't readily find themselves by typing something into Google. So is that sort of along the lines of the challenger sale? Well, there's elements of that. And, yep. and I, um, I'm a big advocate of the idea of challenger. Yep. Parts of, parts of it, all of it? Look, conceptually at a high level, all of it. You yep. know, as a salesperson, if I'm genuinely a specialist yep. and I can genuinely come in and say to a buyer, hey, listen, I see where you, why you might be going down that path, but have you thought about maybe this or yep. have you thought about that? Challenge their thinking. Yes. The trouble is, Brad, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> most salespeople are not deep domain specialists. Yes. And so when they challenge, yep. it, beca it, it comes across sometimes as, you know, you just... Adversarial? Well, adversarial and you're picking holes in something that you don't really understand yourself. Yeah. Yep. Now, think about this. I had someone say to me just recently, Graham, we know more, this is a buyer, yep. we know more about the vendor's products than the vendor's own salespeople do. Yeah, it's, they're not going to be received very well, are they, as no. a salesperson? They're going to be perceived as an order taker. Yeah, and you start trying to challenge someone like that when they already know what they're talking about and yeah. they'll show you the door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Most people, when they go into sales, they want to do it to be a salesperson, not because they've started it as an industry specialist. I mean, sometimes you get the person who is an industry specialist and they go, oh, you can talk, so let's make you a salesperson. Yep. Right? So that I can see, I can see how those people would become, uh, would fit that model of being that type of salesperson. But... Generally, what I found is that personality-wise, they, you know, they have limitations around talking about money. They they don't like to challenge the client. They don't, you know, but they've got all that industry knowledge. Whereas the salesperson's more got the soft skills of challenging. They're comfortable talking about money. They're okay with qualifying that sort of thing. So what you're saying is they need to be a blend of both, the the industry domain expert, and have the the skills, the soft skills of being able to sell. Yes. Um Let's take it up a level, right? Okay. Let, let's start with the buyer. Yep. What does the buyer want? And the research, you know, I got very clear indications what they want. They, they want someone that knows them first and foremost. Yep. Four, four things that came up over and over again. They want a, uh, a salesperson or a vendor that knows them. Yep. So don't turn up and say, so what keeps you awake at night? Yeah. <laughs> you know, or so tell me about your business. Yeah. Those days are over. Yeah. So you turn up having done your research and you know them. Yeah. The second thing is you've got to be able to personalize everything to their context. Yes. All right. Then you have to be able to teach them. That's mm. the third thing. Yeah. The fourth one I think is the most interesting. And that is they all said we want a salesperson that can anticipate our future needs as well. Mm. Mm. If we're going to go on this long-term journey with you as our partner, our supplier. Yeah. I want to know that you can anticipate our future needs and advise us in a way that can help our business. Yeah. So, so sorry. So those four things yeah. are kind of table stakes now mm. when it comes to being successful in sales. So when you say teach them, Graham, what do you mean? Well, educate them about this problem that they've got. Yep. The only reason a, a salesperson is sitting in front of a buyer yep. is because the buyer has, has a, a problem. problem. Yeah. There's pain. Otherwise, they don't give a shit, right? That's right. Yeah, why? there's no reason for them I'm to not, be here. I'm not getting a meeting with anybody, even in my business, unless they've got some sort of perceived need yes. or problem. Yep. And if that's the case, um, then I better be 
one of these people that knows about this problem having solved this problem before and mm. I can go in and advise the client. That's yeah. what they want. They want to they want to know that you know if I've got a problem with my car, yeah, I go to the mechanic who specializes in electronic fuel injection or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So so Graham, I, I've seen these salespeople that just sort of show up and throw up. Yep. They just come in and they go, I must educate my client. I got to tell them everything about their problem in their world. Um yeah. you, you know, do you see that a lot? All the time. Cuz I I mean my I hate it when people come in and they tell me this yep. is your problem. This is yep. So what what advice do you have to salespeople that oh, well, just, um, like to show up and throw up? Well, just again, um, the reason that those people are now failing in droves yeah. is because they haven't understood the buyer. Yeah. Uh, so go back to well, the and people things. don't like being told what to do. No one does. No one. No, yeah. one, no one likes to be sold so, to. So why are salespeople <laughs> turning up and telling them what to do? That's right. You know, look, that's the um, I, that's the only reason I bring that up because you say you need to be able to educate them, right? And it's like, I think it's more um, from my point of view, it's it's not. Yes, we need to be able to educate them if they want to understand, right? If they if they're actually asking, how do you how would you go about fixing this problem, or mm. what do you think the best solution is for this? And yes, then then we we tell them, but only only when they want to to hear it. But if we turn up and say you've got to do this. Oh, it's the old, go back to the old doctor's analogy, diagnose before you prescribe, right? Yeah. You've got to know a, a lot about their business and their problem yep. before you can start offering solutions. Yeah. So the show up, throw up thing is a real danger now. Yes, absolutely. You, you start doing that and it's like, okay, goodbye. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to talk about risk because um, there's a lot of risk in the market at the moment and you, you go into this into some detail. Yeah. So what... Yeah, I'll, I'll let you talk. I've, I've yeah. read some awesome books in recent times. One of them is a, a book um, called Ex- Exponential Organizations. And it talks about what we've got now in the world with these these amazing growth stocks like the, you know, the, the FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix and these right. sort of companies. Yeah. And, you know, in the book it talks about how those, those amazing growth stocks are creating all of this disruption, this VUCA. You know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. <laughs> There's a lot of acronyms there. A lot right? of acronyms, yeah. 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 VUCA. Um, that's a military term, I think. Okay. But yeah, those growth stocks are creating all of this disruption such that traditional linear or legacy businesses, even, you know, businesses that are only 10 years old, are now very worried about disruption or their, you know, their mm. Uber moment. Yep. Someone's going to come and disrupt our industry. Mm. So risk is increasingly on the minds of CEOs and boards all around the world, Yep. right? But I actually, because I'm, I look at everything through the lens of the salesperson, I think the biggest risk to every business right now is less about what's happening externally. Um, I think the biggest risk is how you sell. Mm. Um, you know, and I know we've touched this on this before too, but you know, if, you, if you're going into a business now and the buyer's had an experience with you know, a modern vendor that, that gives them the truly delightful experience. Yep. And you come in pushing and pitching and being salesy. Yeah. All that hard work that's been done leading up to the appointment is just, it's gone. Bang. Yeah. Finished. Yep. I've had that happen to me. It. I've had it too. Yeah. And it's like, I've had these great experiences. Their marketing has brought me in. I've even given my, my mobile number. I've yep. put my email in the yep. system. It's yep. all there. And then yep. I get the call and I'm like, uh, I'm not talking to you, mate, and, and it's gone. Yeah. And it's like that's shot themselves in the foot. It's a hideous ex- experience. It is. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate last year to be invited to speak at Inbound HubSpot's big conference in Boston, and Brian Halligan is the CEO and founder of HubSpot. He stood up on stage in the opening keynote, and he spoke at length about some of the really successful vendors in the world right now, mm. um, the likes of Amazon and Netflix and some of those sort of business. He said that. What they're doing is they've they've flipped the whole product market fit thing on its head, yep. and instead of it being product market fit, it's experience market fit. Yeah, interesting. So he he kept saying over and over again, how they sell is why they win. Yep. How they sell is why they win. Mm. So I think, yeah, you because the bar's being raised so high now in the buyer experience. Yes. If you come in with an old fashioned, you know, prospecting, objection Spin handling, selling. all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. You are shooting yourself in the foot, metaphorically. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. So, Graham, where do you draw the line between marketing and sales? Because marketing, most larger companies or medium-sized companies have a marketing budget and yep. department and all that sort of thing. And it, it's sort of like the nets of put it out there, 
Um, this is what we do. These are our products. Look at us. Yep. You know, we're world leaders, etc. Yep. At, at what stage do you say, okay, um, that's marketing's department and this is sales department's department? Well, so one of the things that we teach at Sales Tribe now is um, a range of things around sales enablement, but buyer journey mapping, ideal customer profiling, buyer personas. What we're now seeing, Brad, is the traditionally separate functions of sales and marketing absolutely coming together. Right. And I've been banging on about this for a few years on LinkedIn. You cannot have a successful content strategy. You cannot have buying stage appropriate messaging that delights the buyer at every touch point yep. unless your sales and marketing leaders yeah. are joined at the hip Interesting. and completely aligned. Yep. So a lot of the successful companies I work with at the moment, Amazon Web Services, one of them, HubSpot's another, those businesses have got not just sales and marketing, but they've got customer success, product management, pre-sales, everybody now yep. joined together. Because well, historically it's been there's sort of been an animus between marketing and sales. It's sort of like salespeople blame marketing for yep. not having enough leads and yep. then uh, the marketing people go, oh, they're a bunch of mavericks and they just do what they're going to do. They don't follow this whole thing. So you're saying that um, modern day selling or organizations, particularly the successful ones, they've got marketing and sales working very closely together. Yeah, marketing has changed now, I argue, as, as much as sales has. Yeah. And, you know, the old days of, you know, pushing out some brand awareness on traditional forms of advertising and, and that sort of thing to create impressions and drive website traffic mm. and not being able to really measure any of that stuff. Yeah. Those days are over. So how involved with marketing do you believe that do you believe salespeople should be? Like they should be joined at the hip. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. You can't So it's like a feedback loop. This is working, this is not working. I'm glad you said feedback loop. Um yeah. what, one of the things that seems to be missing in a lot of the businesses that we talk to is this concept, and it was always, you know, back in the days, it was sort of known or assumed in my role that a big responsibility for me as a salesperson, the conduit to the market, was to grab information, mm -hmm. market intel, yep. and bring it back to the business. Yep. And I think that's been lost in a lot of businesses. Mm. Quite often now, you've got marketing operating in a silo over here, making assumptions about what's happening. Yeah. Sales Who your clients are that you've been talking to for the last 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. Salespeople out in the market having actual conversations yep. and never the twain shall meet. Yes. Whereas now, the really successful vendors, they are completely joined. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little younger than you and um, less experienced, but the I've always... Um, I've always experienced the, the sort of separate world. I mean, I have worked in some organizations where they've, they have been closely linked and they, they've been in the same floor or the same office and uh, they do talk about what would work, what would not work. But um, it's sort of like marketing historically has always been more along the lines of we're going to make this ad yeah. or we're going to do this glossy picture or, or this, this is event. a conference that you're going to be at exactly you know and it's sort of like thanks marketing it's sort of like they're your, your people that all facilitate the events that you go to Correct. so um but now with the more social world i suppose and yeah. platforms it's it's uh, probably I'm, essential they work closely together well it's not just even work closely let's be clear and i'm the same as you i've spent 20 years where there was a chinese wall between sales and marketing and there was this as you say finger pointing thing that used to happen it's not just a matter of working together and sort of understanding each other. It's actually about senior leaders in the business making sure that the 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 way they're measured, managed, and reward is a, is aligned as well. Interesting. You yeah. can't have you can't have salespeople um, with a set of objectives and a completely different set of objectives for marketing. It has to mm. be all the same thing. Yeah. And it has to be all centered around delivering the most delightful buying experience possible. You know, right from that very first interaction. Yeah. I've just heard about your business, Brad, um, and that, that interaction has to be great and it has to be great all the way through to customer success. Yes. Yeah. And beyond. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's it's a challenge. So where do you draw the line between a, a marketing initiative and then the salesperson's own presence on social media, be it, whether it be LinkedIn or whatever yep. it is they're using. Yep. Like, where, where's the line? Like, should should a company take over another an individual's LinkedIn profile, for example, and say, you must post this online? The savvy vendors are doing that kind of thing now, yep. where marketing teams are working very closely with sales teams around messaging 
yep. not just brand awareness. Anyone mm-hmm. can push out their brand. Yeah. But how do I get a specific message to a specific target customer on the right channel at the right time of the day? Yeah. Um, buying stage appropriate, all that stuff. So yeah, they absolutely have to work together. They have to be um, aware of the sales playbook. Yeah. So one of the things we do um, with our clients is map the buyer journey, and now let's build the sales playbook according to the buyer journey. Mm-hmm. And that means sales, marketing, customer success, everyone in the room together. Yep. Everyone understanding who plays what role at which stage. Yep. And making all of that really clear and obvious. Do you, do you ever get people that are uncomfortable using their personal social media accounts to promote the business that they work for? There's there's still a little bit of that. Yep. Um, we run a social selling program. Quite often, I'll get the question, um, you know, right at the outset from someone. Someone yeah. will pipe their hand up and say, "Hey, but hang on, Graham. Um, my LinkedIn profile is my profile. Yeah. Um, my argument is, while you're working, you know, for X Y Z company, yeah, you would be well served, and the company would be well served if you align them. Yes. You know, I mean, LinkedIn well, what does that is- say about the person if they don't want to align? With well, it the says company. a lot, doesn't it? I, I'm not drawing a con- conclusion. I'm just curious. So. I'm drawing one. Yeah. It yeah. says a lot to me. Yeah. If that they're I'm, not really married to the company. If I'm, or, yeah, correct. If I'm yeah. your employee, sorry, yeah. your employer, yeah. and I'm paying you to be part of um, my company, mm. and you know we're very clear about who we target our message to and how we do that, yes. and, you, and you as a personal or yeah. an employer can help me amplify that message, Yeah. and you choose not to. Yep. Where do your loyalties lie, right? Exactly. They may have, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So um, it, has there ever been a situation where they maybe go away and just create a separate account and use that one for the work? Or? I haven't seen that and I'll tell yeah. you why. I think everybody, once they think about it and they realize actually by aligning with my employer is not only going to look good for me, yeah. it's going to enhance my career anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a win win. Maybe they don't feel it. they're going to be in the business for that long. I don't know. It, well, it's, in that case, yeah. Geez, so, mate, you'd be stirring the pot a bit. At some <laughs> I'm, of these I'm always stirring the pot. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a little bit of that, but seriously, when when individuals realise that LinkedIn is the place where you do business and mm. where you enhance your career, yeah. So why not align with your employer? Yeah. Help the business it's amplify the, job you the do. message. It's the job you do. Yeah. So um, you draw the line at Facebook then, or Instagram, or um, no? Look, I think they all have their place. Yeah. Because link, LinkedIn's more work, right? Yeah. More professional and that sort of thing. So, yep. yeah. Okay, um, interesting. It depends where your buyer resides. If they reside on Facebook and Instagram, then, you know, well, that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah so the, the world's changing and uh, we need to adapt to it and change and there's plenty of risks out there. But I, I think um, it's certainly a massive shift uh, in the industry, particularly, I mean, from what I've seen in the last um, 20 years, yeah. even, I'd say maybe even the last five or 10 years, it's it's massive. Uh, and the, and the it's change, just, the approach. it's accelerating. Yeah. I keep saying to my clients, when buyers change how they buy, sellers have to change how they sell. Yeah. yeah. Now, whether you're an entrepreneur in a, in a startup or whether you're a big enterprise salesperson, yeah. it's the same thing. The buyers have changed. Yeah. Mate, um, well, that's it. Outstanding, and um, I've really enjoyed picking your brains, and yeah. uh, I can I can definitely see why uh, people see you as one of their wingmen in the industry, and uh, it's been wonderful talking to you, and I, and yeah, I'm really grateful to have you on the show, and thank you for being uh, my first one, and also uh, just remember if you want to read Graham's book, it's a fantastic read, the future of sales and the profession. Uh, and uh, really recommend you to um, chat with Graham. Graham's actually on social media, so if you want to talk You'll to him. You'll find me on LinkedIn. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Graham, and uh, it's been wonderful uh, talking with you today, and, and thank you guys for watching. So, cheers. cheers.